I'm Kelsey. This is my channel, The Fancy Hat Lady Reads. I am wearing one of my fancy booktube hats, and today I'm bringing you my wrap-up for the month of April, a month late, I know. Um, but this is a wrap-up that includes a couple of different readathons that I participated in, um, but excludes a couple of books that I have already wrapped up elsewhere. I read the last two of my first batch of five-star TBR predictions in April. Those were Conspiracy of Truths by Alexandra Rowland and Winter Rose by Patricia A. McKillop both of which ended up being four star reads, not five, but still good, and both of which I wrapped up in my five star predictions wrap up video, which was a separate video I've already posted, I can link you to it. So aside from those books, the first thing I read in the month was one of the things I read for one of the readathons that I was participating in that month, which was the Unicorn Readathon. I was a co-host on that round of the Unicorn Readathon. It was just a weekend round of that readathon, so it was very short, and the whole point is to read any books with magical creatures in the title, on the cover, or in the book, it can be interpreted fairly loosely. I was hosting some Twitter sprints for that and such, which took some of my energy away from actually reading. Um, the thing that I finished was a volume of manga. Um, this is How to Treat Magical Beasts, Mine and Master's Medical Journal, Volume 1. This was very cute in a way that for me sort of scratched the, um, Tea Dragon Society itch. It's about a girl named Ziska who is an apprentice to a veterinarian, um, but she, like, comes from a magical heritage and she has some sort of, like, latent, untrained magical powers. And her passion is for magical creatures. Um, there's this sort of feeling that this is, you know, one of those worlds where magic is fading as modern uh, modern life progresses and technology comes into play. People don't really see the magic in the world anymore. But this volume has several chapters, and each of them features a sort of different magical veterinary conundrum that Ziska encounters um, and has to get her uh, her master's help with. This does get serious at times about like some actual medical veterinary practice ethics. I enjoyed this, I gave it four stars. The art style, uh, for the most part, isn't anything super special for me, but I did really enjoy the uh, design of the magical creatures. For example, here there are these um, carnivorous flying bunnies. I think there's some, some whimsy there that I really enjoy. Now the other thing that I was reading for the Unicorn Readathon was some individual stories from Clockwork Phoenix 5, which is an anthology. Um, I was reading this for the, the title of the book, not necessarily the content of the stories, though some of those stories did have magical creatures in them. Uh, I wasn't picking or choosing from that, I just made it through the first five stories in this book, um, but I'm not going to talk about those here. I will wrap this book up as a whole when I finish it. Then the next thing that I read was The Cruel Prince by Holly Black. I had this out from the library. I have since returned it. Um, this was one of the Booktube SFF Award nominees in the Young Adult category, and it is also a nominee for the Lodestar Award, which is the YA, not a Hugo. I went into this book with relatively low expectations because I have liked but not loved Holly Black in the past. I really did not like Tithe when I read it when I was in high school. I enjoyed The Darkest Part of the Forest. I thought it was so-so, not quite my cup of tea, but I, I liked it enough. Um, this was more my thing, I think, uh, because it wasn't really urban fantasy. I don't feel like I like Holly Black's urban fantasy because her depictions of, like, modern YA teen life in the real world don't jive with my own experiences of being a teenager much at all back when I was a teenager. But this takes place almost entirely in fairy, 
Um, even though it is a contemporary fantasy novel, the human characters come from our modern world. But you can read this way more as, like, high fantasy court intrigue shenanigans, um, and that is a little bit more my thing. That's something that I feel I can sort of sit back and enjoy on an entertainment level much more easily. I enjoyed this basically as the over-the-top, escapist, ridiculous story that it is. I can enjoy that. That doesn't mean I think it's a great book. I don't think it's a great book, but it's certainly a competent book. I think Holly Black is a seasoned enough writer to know what works in her genre, and she can deliver, like, that juicy drama without any of the, like, sort of awkward stumbling that you sort of see from a lot of YA debut authors. Now this is about a teenage human girl named Jude uh, who has been raised in fairy along with her twin sister Taryn and their older sister who is half fae, half human. And these kids are all being raised in fairy uh, by their mother's first husband, who's the older sister's father, but not the younger two, um, who is a powerful fey lord whom their mother ran away from into the human world um, and, like, got married again to a, a mortal, hence the two mortal kids, and then first fey husband tracked down escaped wife and, like, killed the kids' parents and took all the kids, so it's obviously, like, a very fraught family situation. Like, they're being raised in a world that is not theirs by the guy who killed their parents. So much drama, so much drama. So the twins, Taryn and Jude, are, like, going to fairy nobility school with all of the, like, children of the fey lords and, you know, royalty, where they are tormented for being yucky, nasty humans. And basically the story arc of this book is about Jude, like, being so done with it and so over it and doing deciding she's going to do whatever she needs to fight back and carve out power for herself in the Fey world because it's her home, it's the only place she really knows. She doesn't feel like she can fit in back in the mortal world anymore. And she and her sister are trying both sort of to do this in very different ways. Jude is a fighter at the beginning of the book. She thinks she wants to become a knight. Um, that doesn't work out. She becomes a spy instead. And there is, like, ridiculous fantasy espionage. Her sister, on the other hand, is trying to, like, lay low and behave so that she has an opportunity to marry into a position of security. But Jude's, like, arch nemesis is the youngest prince of, like, the High King's court, who is basically her school bully, which is just as ridiculous as it sounds, I promise you. But basically, the, the feud with the school bully ends up turning into, like, major court drama, espionage, who's gonna be high king, a politics. So I enjoyed this quite a bit. It did what I wanted it to do, which was to grab me and make me want to keep reading to the end. Um, you know, the sort of climactic scene at the end where, like, the plan goes into action. It had me very excited to see, oh, what is happening now? All of that stuff. That's what I want a book like this to do for me, and it did it. That's not to say that I don't have my little issues with it. Um, first, what I ended up posting in the, uh, group read thread for this book, uh, in the Booktube SFF Awards on Goodreads, um, had a lot to do about how this isn't my favorite way to read about fairy as a concept, as a place in fantasy. This very much reads and behaves like, you know, a high fantasy magical court politics stuff. And I prefer fey fantasy where fairy is more mysterious than that, less comprehensible. And when I posted in the uh, discussion thread, I think I sort of 
waved that off as being like, oh, it's a YA fantasy thing as opposed to like adult fey fantasy. That's not necessarily true because I've read adult fey fantasy that also treated fairy like a pretty straightforward um, fantasy kingdom. So I don't think it's a distinctly YA adult divide, but it is a preference that I have when reading fey fantasy. The other thing I want to nitpick about is some of the stuff surrounding what I don't... I don't want to call anything that happens in this book romance because it's not, at least in this part of the story, this is the first in a trilogy. In this part of the story I don't feel like any of the flirtations that are happening are really based on people having real romantic feelings for one another, it's just like sexy flirtations. But around what I will loosely call the romance plot of the book, one, I wish that uh, we hadn't had to have the thing where the two sisters got into like a cat fight over a guy, and I get that like that wasn't really what those two characters are angry at each other about, but it was still like aggravating for me. And secondly, sort of minor spoilery, um, I did not like much the implication that the reason that the guy is so mean to her at school is because he's like really attracted to her but he's like repulsed at himself for being attracted to a human. It gets dangerously close for me to like the he's being mean to you because he actually likes you thing which is yucky and toxic. That said I'm not sure like any of the flirtations that happen in this book should be taken seriously as like romantic relationships given that they are all messed up and I think that's pretty clear on the surface. We'll see where the series goes because I'm assuming because this is YA fantasy that there will be some serious romance somewhere down the road, but I, I, I don't take any of this particularly seriously on the romantic front. I believe this does share a world with some of Holly Black's prior fae or fairy books. Um, definitely the darkest part of the forest, um, and maybe also Tithe and its sequels. There are appearances by some of the main characters from the darkest part of the forest at the end of the book, and I was glad that I knew who those people were when I saw them, but it's done in such a way where you don't actually need to know who they are going into the book. I think I've also heard that there are similar sort of cameo appearances um, by characters from Tithe and its sequels, but I didn't recognize those characters. And I just realized how graphic novel heavy this wrap-up is going to be, because the last three things I have to talk about, two of them are graphic novels, and the one is something I've reviewed already and I'm just going to direct you off to my review. Um, but the next thing I read was the only thing I technically claimed I read for Tome Topple, uh, and it is a graphic novel. It's on a sunbeam by Tilly Walden. I did not prepare for Tome Topple. I didn't have space to just add extra 500 page books to my TBR at the time that it rolled around. Um, so the thing that I squeezed in was a 500 page graphic novel. Uh, this is available as a webcomic. You can read the whole thing for free online, so I'm going to link that for you. But I placed a hold on this at my library immediately after seeing that it got nominated for a Hugo in the graphic story category, and uh, I had previously been relatively unaware of this book's existence. I am usually not interested in anything that gets nominated for graphic story at the Hugos, so seeing something on that list that made me think, oh, actually, I would really like to read that, that was such a pleasant, shocking surprise. This is a sci-fi story, um, and it's in print form. It's being marketed, I think, as a YA graphic novel. The main character is certainly a teenager. She's recently graduated from high school and then there are flashbacks. Um, it's told like half in the present and then half in the past during her time at school. This is about a girl named Mia who has just joined this spaceship crew that does like um, construction and refurbishment on old buildings and architecture. And this is where I sort of have to explain how weird this world is. Um, you get 
sort of more visual world building in this book than anything else. It doesn't make a lot of like logical rules of a sci-fi world sense. It's, it's more a visual landscape atmosphere, but you have like these large buildings, large amounts of architecture um, that are just sort of floating around in space. And that's sort of how this world works. It's very surreal feeling. And yes, there are planets in this world. Earth does exist. Um, so this is some version of our universe, but it is clearly not like a logical hard sci-fi one. I'm going to show you some art so you can sort of see what I mean. So this is like, I think this is part of the school that Mia goes to. Um, you can see there's just sort of like train tracks in space. And it's not like people wear space suits. It's not like gravity is, is, is a concern whether or not it's there. People can just like walk around here. Uh, let me see if I can get you another example. For another example, like here you can see some of this weird decrepit space architecture that's like crumbling. It starts out while we're looking at the art also in like two color schemes. Like the flashback timeline is these like blue colors and the current timeline is like these warmer colors, but after it sort of used that device to establish that there are two timelines, it starts to blend those colors together and you get like some very gorgeous looking art using warm and cool tones that looks like this or like this. You can also see that like the spaceships in this world are like this. They are these like big flying fish. Um, so very cool visually. Uh, this is also a world that without explanation doesn't seem to have any men. Um, there just aren't any and it's never commented upon. So everyone in this book, all of the characters are girls and women except for one character who is non-binary. I'd say that from my limited perspective it seems like the non-binary character's story was handled pretty well in this. Their crewmates respect them and stand up for them when people don't. That said, I am definitely not an Own Voices reviewer for non-binary representation, so don't take my word on it. The thing that does confuse me a little bit, and I wonder if there's something I'm missing here, is that I think we're supposed to accept that this is a world that doesn't have binary gender to begin with, so it makes little sense to me that the terminology used for this character is non-binary. I don't know, I think there might have been a cat that was referred to with he, him pronouns. So like this world might have a concept of binary gender that just doesn't come into play because there are no men and that's not explained. Um, I think you just have to with this book accept that there are things like that world building wise that just aren't explained. Um, and part of my brain wanted answers. Um, and I sort of had to turn that part of my brain off. And once I did that, I really enjoyed the story of this book. I think that Tilly Walden's art and storytelling style is primarily emotional. I think that all of the panels in this are really strongly trying to evoke a feeling as opposed to being concerned with something like world building. So the story is about Mia who went to this boarding school in space um, and there she was like a kind of rebellious, not great student, um, but she met a girl named Grace. And Grace is the opposite of Mia in a lot of ways. She's a very rule-abiding, very studious uh, student, um, but she has some 
backstory, there's a story about where she comes from and why that's different. And the story in the flashback timeline is the story of Mia's romantic relationship with Grace. And in the present timeline, it's about her friendships with these people on this spaceship crew, and also the lengths to which she ends up going to reconnect with Grace, who was taken out of school by her family. There's a, a cat in the windowsill. I don't know if you can tell. Cat? Come say hello? Hello? Okay, you can go back to sitting in the windowsill. So I gave On a Sunbeam four stars. It definitely gets very weird and surreal by the end, but the art is beautiful, um, and I really loved these characters, and I really enjoyed it. So then the next thing I want to mention is the novella that I already have a review up for. This is Finding Baba Yaga by Jane Yolen. This is a Tor.com novella told in verse. It's ostensibly YA. I did a double review of this along with Snow White Learns Witchcraft by Theodora Goss. I will link that for you. You can check it out. But basically, I gave this four stars. Um, it's an interesting blend of fairy tale and sort of modern contemporary issues coming of age story, um, go check out my review. And then the last thing I read in the month that I'm going to talk about here, again, I skipped over the two books that I was uh, reading that were my five-star TBR predictions. Um, but the last thing that I squeezed in at the end of the month because I felt like I was on a graphic novel kick and I was like, whoa, more graphic novels. I read The Adventure Zone Volume 1, Here There Be Gerblins. This is by all of these people whose last name is McElroy, um, illustrated by Carrie Peach. I picked this up purely because one graphic novel, two nominated for the Booktube SFF Awards. And there is definitely a target audience for this, and I am just definitely not it in several ways, so I didn't get along with this. This is based on a podcast, which I have never listened to, where all of these guys, last name McElroy, I believe they're all related, um, play D&D &D on the podcast, and it's supposedly riotously hilarious. Um, I've never listened to the podcast, and I've never played D&D, &D, um, and I don't really know how it works. So I was reading this having been told that, yes, you can, in fact, basically enjoy this as a fantasy story. And yeah, you can read it as a fantasy story. I didn't get much out of it as a fantasy story, though. There is a lot that's very obviously there for humor, and the comedy didn't work for me um, in this format. And I've heard people who have listened to the podcast say that the comedy doesn't come across as well in the graphic novel. I got one good real out loud laugh out of this, but just one, and it like shocked me because I hadn't laughed at anything. I think that without knowing anything about the people behind these characters, I had no reason to care about the characters. It's not like any of these characters really have backstory motivations, real connections with each other. Like, we don't even get explained how these characters even supposedly know each other, even though they're all on a quest together. Um, the plot, I could not keep track of the plot. It's sort of fundamentally a basic plot, but I, I can't remember a thing about it. These three characters are on a journey to deliver something to someone, but I think someone's not there when they get there, or they get waylaid by something. Yeah, that's basically my understanding of the plot of this story. I remember how it ended, but not how we got there or why. The art is very colorful, so so in that sense it's nice to look at, but otherwise it, it didn't stand out for me much, it didn't do much for me. You get this format where the, the character who's the moderator, there's a name for that in d and is that, is that the Dungeon Master? Anyways, this character comes in and, like, talks to the players and tells them what they're allowed to do and what they're not allowed to do, which, like, on a very basic storytelling level, like, I can understand that as, you know, a, a narrator character who has 
rules for how this world works. It, it works for me in that sense, but I, I don't myself know the rules of the game, so it's not like I get any of those jokes. There's a lot of randomly fighting random stuff that randomly shows up for no particular reason. I, I just, I don't get it. I just don't get it. Um, I did give it two stars. It did get the one laugh for me. The art is nice. There was nothing, there's absolutely nothing like brazenly offensive or bad about it. I, I, I'm, I'm gonna put that out there because my one stars are reserved for things where there is something, you know, that stood out to me as repulsive or like bad in some way. And there's nothing like that in this. It just wasn't, there was nothing for me in this. So I gave it two stars. Like maybe if bands of questing folks is like actually your subgenre of fantasy, like maybe then if you had no experience of the podcast or of D&D, &D, like maybe you would get something out of that story. But that, that isn't even my type of fantasy, guys. Like it just didn't work. I'm so sorry. I know people love The Adventure Zone. So these were the books I talked about here. Let me know if you've read any of them or what you think. Let me know if you participated in either of the readathons that I did in the month of April and if you did better than I. Um, anyhow, I hope you're having a nice day. That is all. Bye for now. <laughs>